just letting it flow rather than getting stuck in your mind. Let's just absorb what you need to absorb today and let the rest flow. Yeah? Okay, now sit. So, I am so uh, overly joyed that this woman has chose to join us in this amazing event. How many of you guys love Betsy Holmes? Yeah. Right? We all do. And I think the reason why is she exudes love from every pore of her body. And that is why she's creating this massive movement. That is why she is literally part of changing this world. And I feel so grateful. The more time I get to spend with her, the more time we get to build our own friendship. Even as Crossline, I truly feel like she's part of my family. So I love, love, love her. And she, talk about knowing how to build events. This girl can get a couple grand of people in a room at any given point. How many of you guys would like that? 2,000 people in a room. So she is going to help us start from the beginning all the way to these massive events that will create the momentum you want in your business at whatever level you're at right now. So everybody give her a huge round of applause. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Speaking of events, um, we are at an event. And this is an amazing event. And your creator was just standing on the stage. And isn't she amazing? Thank you. And so it is an honor to be a part of this event. It's an honor to be standing in front of you. Um, six years ago, well, almost six years ago, when I started my doTERRA journey, I was afraid to do a home class by myself. I didn't want to stand up in a room in front of even four or five people because I didn't think that I had the ability to do that. And actually, I didn't think I had anything to offer. I always thought it would be somebody else that was good at teaching or somebody else could show the way, and I needed that somebody else. And I was always going to need that somebody else. Until the oils came into my life. And uh, my friend Laura, who introduced me to the oils. I think she's in here. Laura, you in here? She just walked in with her. She uh, introduced me to the oils. And uh, we set up our first class. And she did it for me. And then I said, oh, I'm going to do another one. You do another class for me. And she did. She did another <laughs> class for me. And it was the same week. Because a bunch of people missed my first class. And then I said, hey. So there's a person from that class who wants to host a class. Can you come do it? And she said, OK, I'll do it. And by the way, we were all new, so like none of us knew that you just don't do that. But she, she said, yeah, I'll do it. And it was my friend. She invited 12 people. She had, a, had these people sitting in her living room. And she said um, on, on the way there, she said, Betsy, I'm so excited. There's all these people coming. I, I, this is going to be awesome. I'm really excited about this. Um, what time are you getting here? And I told her, I'm going to be there like 30 minutes before the class. And I think Laura's going to be there a little bit earlier to help you get all set up. <coughs> and I called Laura right after that. And she said, Betsy, my babysitter fell through. And I went, what? <laughs> huh. She said, yeah, my babysitter fell through. But you can do it. You can do it. You know about oils. You've heard me talk about them a couple of times. You can do it. And she's like, you've got this. And I was paralyzed. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to cancel this class. There's 12 people sitting in this lady's living room. I'm not going to do it. I just, I don't know what I have to offer them. I don't know how this is going to work. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I sat in that living room, faced my fears, and I told my story, and I passed around some oil, and I told them how I enrolled. And that was it, and all 12 people enrolled. <laughs> and I don't think that's typical, because even to this day, sometimes I'll have a class and no one will enroll right away. And they'll be like, I'm going to talk to my husband, or whatever. And I'm like, OK, I know they're going to come back, um, especially with follow-up, right? But I did that, and I faced my fears, and that's what happened. And it proved to me, anybody can do this. Anybody can teach classes. But what about these big events that started coming my way? Right away, we enrolled like 40-some people maybe in our first month, just throwing a small team. And Dr. Hill was sent out to Ohio. OK, 
that's a big deal. And I thought, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? You know, your heart's beating out of your chest. I don't know what to do. Over time, uh, we were able to put together events and continue to perfect that over the last six years. I'm sorry, I want to adjust that. Um, we were able to perfect what we were doing. And so today, I hope to share with you some of the things we've learned along the way about putting on events. And I want to also inspire you and encourage you that you can do it. You can put on a big event. You can bring an expert to town and put on a big event and get people in those seats and take a risk and do it because it is worth it. It will create momentum on your team. Where should I aim this thing? Okay, good. This is a picture of our third event in Central Ohio. Um, I think this is the third month that I was involved in doTERRA. There's Emily Wright um, in the picture on the left with uh, my enroller, Laura King, and one of my top line leaders, Carrie Salmon. And then that's Carrie, pregnant, on the stage in this uh, venue at a country club, which my husband happened to work at so that we got the room for free. Um, and that was a group of 200 people. We went from our first event, just a couple of people, and, to, and it kept growing. And so we were like, well, we're doing something right. But then we were always thinking, how can we make it better? We worked, we, we did the things that were good, and then we looked at all the stuff that maybe went wrong or we didn't like so much. And by the way, did you know that oftentimes when something goes wrong, you're the only one who knows about it if you're putting on an event? I bet you there's several things that aren't going exactly according to plan, even with this event, but you'll never know about it because this is a special event when people come together and they do this together, it just flows. It just flows and comes together. You don't need to worry about even making mistakes. I want you to think about if you're going to have a big event, what is your message? What is it that you want to come across? What do you want people to feel when they come to your event? How are you going to make them feel that? How are you going to make them feel what it is you want them to feel? Do you want them to feel special when they come to your event? Do you want them to feel that like they just came to an event they can't get anywhere else? Do you want them to think, do you want them to feel inspired, encouraged? Do you want them to feel like they matter? when they come to your event? This is something to keep in your mind about what you want them to feel. But also, what is that message? There's, there's going to be plenty of content offered at your event, I'm sure. But aside from the content, what's the overall theme? What's the overall message? Because if you start with that, you can work out all the other details from what your theme uh, is going to be. You can look to your leaders. Who are the people you're working with? Include <coughs> them. Include your team. Don't do events alone. It's awful. Don't do events alone. <laughs> Make it, it can still be your baby. It can still be your imagination, your creativity. But when you bring those other leaders into it and you make them feel a part of it, it will be so much better than it would have been on your own. You will be adding in so many other gifts and talents and skills and that special sauce that other people bring to the plate that you don't have. And from the beginning, you work as a team. And I would pick just a couple of leaders. Now, if you're planning an event, it's hard to plan an event with like 15 leaders, OK? So narrow it down. Who do you work really well with? <laughs> pick a couple of people that have different skill sets than you, different gifting, and plan with them. And pick their brains and strategize and put it together. If you put it together as 15 people, you are going to feel like, you know, too many chiefs, no Indians, right? It's going to be hard. So when you're looking at venues, you can look at free venues. How many of you have used a free venue for a bigger event? There's, you can find them, right? It takes a little bit more energy or work. You might need to contact people that you know, people who maybe run a, a recreation center or somebody you know at church that will let you use their extra uh, you know, uh, work room or whatever that they have. You, you, you can contact people that you know and find events in the beginning or event spaces that are cost effective or basically free. For the longest time, we used the library, <laughs> OK? And how we got away with that, because I don't know what your state says about that, but in our state, for to use a, a library, it has to be something where you're not selling something. 
Well, when we're teaching a class, we're not selling something. We just made sure no one showed up with like books to sell or product or anything like that. We simply taught a free educational class on natural medicine, and we told the library that's what we were doing, and we educated them ahead of time that, hey, is it okay if we, the room is gonna smell really good, but it's pure, it's never gonna harm anyone. If you tell them ahead of time that there's going to be a smell in the room, a beautiful aroma in the room, then they will be prepared for it. If you don't tell them ahead of time, here's what that might look like. You might have an employee that comes in the next day that has no idea why the room smells like that, and they already have it in their head that they're just allergic to all fragrances. And so then they go and tell the boss person, we can't ever have those people back here again because of that smell they put in here, right? But they, it's because they don't have education, isn't it? That's why they think that. So you don't want to even avoid pitfalls like that when you're planning a venue. Communicate to them what's going to happen in their event space, okay? Don't just let it surprise them. Um, look to your budget to guide you on where you can go. If you don't have a budget, and most of us didn't when we were in the beginning, right? Um, I didn't have money, definitely not, to throw at my events. Um, some of you know my story. I didn't have money to even buy my oils. But I was really thankful that I was sharing and I was being able to pay for my oils. So. If you look at your budget, or if you don't have a budget, you can create one. What, is, what do I mean? Well, if you need a room for 100 people, and you, uh, you know, can do some creative things, where you can either charge for your event, right, per person, and you can decide what that number would be, and then that's how much money you have for your budget, or you can do a raffle where they pay and they get to, uh, you know, to go in for the door prize to get something for uh, coming um, and paying to come in. So. That's something that you can do. Um, and again, you want to plan and bring in uh, experts, people that you know that have done events, people that, you know, even if just cross line from you or whatever, contact upline leader or cross line person that's done events and ask them, pick their brain, and, and plan with that advice. So, how about inviting to people's events? Would you think that the single most important thing about your event is actually inviting people to it? We talk about this in our home classes, right? You have to actually invite people to enroll people. But there are some ways that you can do that uh, with a larger event. And before I tell you those ways, I'm going to preface it with this. Make sure that you are giving, you are not putting your event information out there until you have it all. Okay? I've learned a huge lesson in the past. I didn't, I probably didn't think, oh, 700 people are going to show up to this event. So what I did was I would say, Oh, there's an event and it's coming, and um, it we're not sure of the location, but it, it's a, it might be at this time or this time. We're not sure that yet. And you know, so what did I invite for myself with 700 people excited but not knowing where, when, what? Right? I invited emails, calls, texts, and I spent most of my time answering those instead of working on my business. So you're not an event planner, right? That's not what you signed up for in doTERRA. However, you can plan events, and you can do them in a smart way so that you're not overwhelming yourself. So we'll get into more on how to deal with that. But when you're inviting, you could use free invites like S'more. Has anyone ever used s'more.com? It's an awesome online thing that you can use, and you can put pictures in and everything, and it's free. And you can create a flyer and a link and just send it to people. And you can use. Facebook, right? Facebook is even better because you can see who's coming, who's not coming, who may be coming. You know who to follow up with, right? Facebook is a great place to do invites. Sometimes I'll do a s'more and put the link on my Facebook invite, right? Um, and then you have an invitation <coughs> that is just made by you. You could do it in an email. You can do it by hand. You can mail it to people, give it to people in person. You can go the extra mile when you're doing an event for 700 to 1,000 people eventually, because you will, okay? If you take this on, it will grow. You might want to consider the online options, <laughs> right? So when I have my leaders inviting people to an event that I'm putting on, I tell them to create their own Facebook invitations for it. Why is that? Yeah, I want them to be able to follow up with their people. I want them to be able to see who on their team is coming and not coming. I encourage my leaders for leadership retreat to do that. I wanted them to know what leaders on their team are not going to leadership retreat, and so they could contact them. That's really important. So 
you don't have to have just one solid invite. Now, if it's a paid event and there's a registration process, everyone's Facebook invite still needs to direct them to that, right? And be really clear. Okay, so let's talk about Eventbrite in that case. This is the event management site that I use often. Um, a couple of things, I put email on one side and a Google phone number on the left side. Create an email for your event. Why would you want to do that? Well, if you're like me, you already have a lot of emails in your email account. And if you separate out and create a new email address for your particular event, and this is for large events, I'm not talking about classes here, but I have a particular email, it's rsvp.doterra or whatever, and I have any event that I'm doing, I start over every time with the same email address, People are going to RSVP to that site or they're going to, if they need a contact email at Eventbrite, they're going to use that one. Because I can manage that one event all in one spot. And if I get help, which I'm going to talk about in a minute about getting help for your events, then I, I can have someone else sign into that account and manage those emails, right? So I can do some delegating there with that. The Google phone number is pretty awesome. It's free to get Google Talk. You can go online, sign up. You can even choose your phone number. Did you know you can even make it like, say like, you know, 321 Oils or something like that. Whatever you want to do. You can make your own phone number. And instead of people calling your phone directly, which actually is really awful right before your event, and that's when people call you if they're calling you for an event, right? You're planning an event, and 30 people are calling your phone to get directions right before the event. But you're planning it. So that's not cool. So what we did is we did this Google number, and what it does is it sends you all your voicemail messages in a text and it sends it to that number, and you can have that number linked to your email account. You can link it to someone else who's in charge at your event and then switch it the next time. So I had another leader checking the phone messages for that event. So this is something that you might want to consider. Eventbrite is a management site. How many of you have used Eventbrite before? Well, if you're here, I think that the, maybe the leadership retreat was done through Eventbrite and everything. You buy your ticket and everything. They do take a percentage. They take a, a chunk of your ticket price. So you only consider Eventbrite when you're actually going to charge for an event or you are going, you know, because then you're going to add that cost in. Um, or you're going to, um, if, if it's a free event, they don't take anything, right? They just let you use it for free, which is great. But if you're going to charge for an event, you want to make sure that you filter in the price that Eventbrite is going to charge into your price of your ticket. Or it can add it on later. You can choose which one. but. <coughs> just remember that they do take a chunk. So if you're able to do your event where people pay you ahead of time or cash the door, great. But this, if you want to do it this way when you're charging money, they're going to take a, a little percentage there. Um, with the event management site, though, so easy to register people. You can literally go online and print all the registrations and do them alphabetically at your registration table. It's streamlined and that sort of thing. So that's great. Okay. So I love, I love this because... <laughs> This was one of my biggest struggles when I started leading my team and leading, leading events. And I knew everything that needed to be done, everything that needed to be done was right up here. I knew what needed to be done for this event and there's a ton of stuff. Now how do I delegate that to all my team members to help them incorporate them and, and get everybody volunteering and excited, right? And I loved this thing on the left here. It talks about the differences between a boss and a leader, right? And we all sign up for no because we don't want a boss. I don't want a boss. Do you want a boss? A boss, um, you know, drives others, inspires fear, blames others, says I, knows how it's done, depends on authority, uses people, takes credit, commands, says go. Not cool. And this is what I was learning with events. You coach others, you inspire enthusiasm, you help fix things, you say we, you show how it's done, you depend, you depend on goodwill, develop people, give credit, ask, and say let's go. Let's go. And this was something that, you know, got this whole camaraderie thing going. We did events. We were working together. And we started um, making sure that people knew that the event was about the people that were coming in, not about us, not about me. It was about them, their whole purpose for the event. So I put this funny picture because <laughs> you want to ask an expert, right? But this was funny, it was like a baton website. This girl's really good. So she, this lady's getting ready to ask her, how do you hold a baton between your, no, I don't know. But I just put it there 
So it kind of got me to tell you what's next. But, <laughs> you know, you want to invite an expert to your event. It can't be you. If you do a big event that is just you or your leaders, then make it really special through the content, something they've never heard before. So, for example, when we were early days of our team and we, were, we wanted to bring everybody together for a big event, we thought, you know what? Nobody's ever taught a class yet on mood management. So let's do our first one together, show everybody how to do it, and then they can go teach their mood management classes, right? So that was the one idea. Then when we have an expert that's from out of town, we saw that more people attended. So if Peggy Smith was going to come from Utah to Columbus, Ohio, to do a class on something, we would act like... I mean, Neil Armstrong and Obama were coming together at a class. Because, I mean, that's just, that's what you want to do. You want to create excitement about an expert because that, that information won't come again. That's something that's special, right? How many of you have been to a sold out Dr. Hill event? <laughs> With the standing room only. I mean, people are like, you know, pushing each other <laughs> going in the door. It's like a new kid on the block concert. <laughs> Back in the day. But I mean, it, it is awesome. And, and, and it's because there's this excitement and this creation of he teaches something that's special, right? He brings something special to the plate. So what are you saying about your expert? And when they come, are you going to introduce them and tell everybody who they are and where they're from and what, they are, what their likes are and, and make them human? Not just, they went to this university, and they were really awesome at this, and, uh, and yeah, this many, this many years' experience. Welcome them to the stage. Or are they a human who have children, maybe? And maybe they, their favorite color is coral. I don't know, but it's a fun detail. <laughs> and I, I mean, maybe they really, really hate chocolate and really, really only like fruit as dessert. It's funny. I don't know why, but I like to know that kind of stuff about people before I learn from them. Just kidding. But it is fun to throw more human, fun, personal things in there. If you have a story with your expert, if you know your expert, or you, you even just when you uh, maybe don't know your expert, but if you call them ahead of time and say, thank you for coming to my city. I just want to get to know you a little bit. Can I ask you a few questions about yourself? Do you have children? What did you do before doTERRA? What's your favorite oil? Now you have ammo. Now you have something. <laughs> Uh, but you can use, when they come, you can uh, share with your group and your crowd to make them human and to have people get to know them. Um, I think my, this slide might have been out of order, but I will talk about this for a second, about just leading humbly and what servant leadership is. So we ask a lot of people to help at our events. Um, our team is everywhere now. It's all over the world, and it's 45,000 plus some people. Unreal. And our local population is only around 15,000. So we have, but we still have a lot of people in Ohio, okay? So when we do a large event in Ohio, that's a lot of people. We need a lot of volunteers. And we want to treat our volunteers as if they are the ultra, ultra special guests because they are, because without them, the event wouldn't happen. So what are they going to be doing, though, those people? They're going to be out there, right? There's people right out there right now not able to hear some of this because they're going to be serving, right? So we give them perks. We reserve the first couple of rows of seats for our volunteers. We don't just give them whatever's left in the back because they're going to come in late. So we make sure that we're rolling out the red carpet and making it fun to serve, and making it rewarding to serve, and we hopefully, and we don't always tell them, hey, we're gonna give you a present, but we give them a present. We put it together a little oil bag or a little gift bag and make sure that they get it, and then we serve with them. You know, you don't have to be Johnny on the spot to everyone, because that's why you have volunteers, but if something's falling apart, you are responsible. Not your volunteers, you are responsible. And I learned that early on, I thought, uh-oh, something's going wrong. And I just kind of looked around and like, who's going to do it? And then I went, oh, wait, this is my event. I think I'm the only person that is going to actually go do it. Just because I'm the one who feels responsible for the event and how people are going to learn and handle this. <coughs> so, content. Let's talk about your content for your event just a moment. It's at the heart of all that we do. I loved that. I loved that picture and I took it 
because it goes back to your message, right? Building up your content. What are you going to be sharing with people? Are you just going to share a bunch of information and just kind of dump it on them and, and say, here's all the facts and that's it? Or are you going to share your story? Are you going to have other people share their story? Ask your expert when they come, hey, would you mind sharing a personal story about how you got involved in this? Something that people can connect to when they're learning and then make it fun. Even if you don't even know what joke you're going to tell, tell a joke. <laughs> now, don't be vulgar, but tell a joke. Because people, when they're laughing, they learn. They remember. They like to laugh. Some people don't like to laugh. I like to laugh. I think things that are funny are just, like, I just want to have that in my head all the time. If it's funny, I like it. I know a lot of people are really serious, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's worth it to put a smile on people's face, right? And if you're like afraid, because you're like, oh, I'm not really the joke telling type, well, don't, don't tell a joke then, but make, make them smile about something. Tell a good story that makes them feel warm or something, because that's going to be a part of your content. Content without that is no good. You have to put your heart into it. And you do that by being vulnerable and sharing your stories, and then making people laugh, however you can do that. Okay, are we ready for the biggest deal of all? I keep saying that for every slide. <laughs> this is all peppermint that Leon brought up here. Thank you, Leon. Um, have you ever been to a doTERRA event? I've had, I've been to a few that, um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I've been to a couple. Have you ever been to one, though, that they forgot because it wasn't an oil event, like an introduction to oil? was maybe about another topic or subject. Maybe it was a business training. And nobody used to any oils. I've, I've been to some of those. Like, wait, why didn't we open a bottle of oil? Even if we're not learning about essential oils, we're an essential oil company. And right now, I need some peppermint. <laughs> Do you? Get your peppermint out. <laughs> so, you know, it wakes us up. It gives us energy. It helps us learn. It connects our memories with what we're learning. Peppermint, all on its own. That's why we pass it first in the class, isn't it? I've always thought that. I thought, you know, they were sneaky at doTERRA. They put peppermint first on the list, you know, in that to show you what essential oils are, and that's when we always pass it. But it's also that you're going to retain everything you hear today, right? <laughs> you're going to remember it. So put oils in the water. I ask some volunteers. That one of the jobs that we give volunteers is to say, hey. Can you bring your diffuser, put your name on the bottom of it, plug it into the room, and be responsible to refill it throughout the event. Thank you so much. And then they get a gift. Okay? Because we want people to have an essential oil experience. I don't care what kind of event it is, right? So have you ever invited someone to a Dr. Hill event or something like that, and they're brand new, they've never enrolled? And are they going to get an introduction to essential oils at a Dr. Hill event? No. But how are you going to introduce it to them? You're going to pass an oil or put it in a diffuser or have them drinking it in the water, okay? And, and really, I even went to like a corporate doTERRA event once and there were no oils. And I went right to them right away and I said, we've got to have oils, a diffuser or something. And now, can you believe at conventions, have you seen the diffusers that come out of the chandeliers? Like, they go over the top. It's amazing. And it makes our event special, doesn't it? So, that's awesome. And it's really, really important. I want to talk for a second about flow. I don't know how much time I have. Somebody's going to keep track of me, right? Um, with the flow of your event, make sure that people are getting what they need. If they need to stand up and stretch, if they need to, um, you know, have a break somewhere, make sure you're putting breaks in. Don't put two really serious, maybe really emotional things right next to each other and then put all the content stuff that's heavy and with the training materials on a different time. Mix in inspiration with training and with all the details. Mix it together. Make sure it flows so that you, you don't go from, you know, something really serious in training to crying to crying again to crying and then serious training. You know, put it together so that it, you know, flows together. Um, that's, I feel it's really important and uh, something, you know, if you want to put a panel discussion in to break up the monotony, put a panel discussion in. 
Those are really fun. Now, protect your message because panel discussions can go way off topic. So we're protecting our theme, keeping it on, uh, on focus, right? Raffles, I love raffles. These are super fun, but they can go too crazy, right? You can be standing up on the stage at the end of an event and going and going and going and going with a raffle. Give away stuff, but don't give away hundreds of things because you'll be there all night. Okay, I've seen people say, I want to break up these three family physician kits. Okay, well now you're donating 30 items instead of three. And honestly, just give away the whole family physician kit. <laughs> just give it away. Or, or give a couple items away together or something. Because people, you know, we want to honor their time. Right? At an event, we want to honor their time, and we want to make sure, especially for the people who want to enroll, we have that time at the end that we can connect with them. We don't want it to just be all about the raffle. So we do some giveaways. It depends what kind of event. It's a training event. We do them throughout the day. Um, but we'll do them um, mostly at the end if it's an event. We want them to sit in their seats and stay there the whole time. We don't want them to go early or anything like that. So we wait for the raffle till the end. This is where you can make money for your event. It depends on what you charge, but if you're going to have a uh, really efficient flow through your registration process, you might want to consider tearing these off ahead of time if they're um, going to be, if you're going to do some sort of deal for like 10 of them at a time. We just tear them off in sheets of 10 so that when, oh, you get, you know, uh, you know, five tickets for $5 or you get 15 tickets for 10, which one do you want? Right? So we already have those strips of 15 torn off. Um, all the time in the beginning, this is all we did as raffle. We were always just hoping, okay, are we going to make it to make what we paid for the room? <coughs> okay, so never put yourself in a position where you would never be able to pay it if your raffle didn't make enough money. Okay? Don't know if you're trying. Don't do it. Okay? You might be tempted. Don't do it. Oh, gotta go back. So one of your um, important jobs as, a, as one of your volunteers on your team, get them excited, include them, right? You're including team members. What we usually do is we include our leaders in the planning process, and then we also include anyone on our team, even if they just started and they're really excited, they're probably your best greeter because they're excited, right? They just started and they want to be included. They're happy to be a part of a team. They want to be part of camaraderie. Um, sometimes we use uh, the husbands as greeters to get them to come to the event. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we were like, hey, we need some ushers for the event. Do you mind seating people at the event? Because we need some guys for that. And everyone else's husband is doing it. And they go, all right, honey. And they go, and then they stand in the back of the room, and they're like, wow, Dr. Phil's amazing. Right? And, and also, their wife is so happy <laughs> that their husband came to the event. So ushers or men are great for that, um, but also helping set up and tear down the room. You need volunteers for that, and men are the best for that. And they always like to help. Sometimes they don't feel very helpful in your doTERRA business at first. Men, what, tear down some chairs and put away? Sure, right? Not a big deal, but like girls don't like to do that stuff. Anyway, um, <laughs> not this girl. But we, we tell our volunteers, you know, greeting the people who are going to be greeters, we're going to go with their skill set, okay? I'm not going to ask my person who never, ever smiles, who's having a really hard time, has an Eeyore philosophy, to be the greeter. <laughs> I'm going to arm them with a bottle of wild orange and lots and lots of uh, smiles like a, you know, rainbow, uh, like a uniform puking rainbow. <laughs> and, and I'm going to make them the greeter because they are going to welcome people and they're going to feel special. Remember, I'm going back to what I want people to feel. I want them to feel special. I want them to feel like this is their event, that we did this for them. And so greeting is a really big deal. I like how skipping twice every time. Sorry. Stay. Okay. So, details. How many of you are detail-oriented people? Oh, a few of you. Yeah. <laughs> and you're excited? <laughs> All right. Thank you. I am not a detail-oriented person, but I have become one. Because I realize that details in events are kind of important. Maybe really important. So your PowerPoint, right? Having those together, having someone organize those. If you're not an organized person, find someone on your team who is. Put together a Dropbox. Have them put their PowerPoints in the Dropbox together so it's all in one place. Make sure that things are done ahead of time. With PowerPoint, if you're creating your own PowerPoint, how many of you like to create PowerPoints? 
I actually like it now. I used to hate it, was afraid of it, thought I could never do it, spent hours on it, cried over it. Now I like sit there and I love creating PowerPoints. I love finding pictures that express what I'm trying to say. And it's, it's, an, it's like an act of art for me. And yet, it's also the biggest headache sometimes on the last minute when you need to create PowerPoint. Google Images, one of my favorite places to go online. What is it you're trying to say or get across? Put that in the search of Google Images and there will be a picture of it, I promise you. And guess what speaks to people so much louder than words? Picture, it's like a thousand words, right? Like PowerPoints with tons and tons of words on them. Don't look at this slide. But PowerPoints with tons and tons of words on them are overwhelming and overstimulating. And unless you're a scientist or a doctor and you need to have a big graft and a whole bunch of other stuff on there, put a picture and then put it in your notes, what you want to say for that, so that you can have you know, visually <coughs> stimulating things and keep people's attention. Give people maps. This is another detail. Like We've been learning in Columbus when people come in for a big event, there's thousands of people, which is really exciting and a lot of pressure, just a little. They want to know where to go, how to get there, is there parking, is, are there places to eat? That's an extra really paying attention to detail thing, isn't it? Gathering that information. So have someone on your team who likes details to do that. And then they can give you that document and you can upload it as a link on your event right or whatever you need to do. Banners. Um, you know, banners are a really beautiful addition to a room. Give those doTERRA pull-up banners. Those are kind of expensive. So we borrow them from each other. I, I think see some of you in the room still have one of mine if you want to return it, thanks. <laughs> Put your name on it. I'm just kidding. But we borrow them from each other. I have leaders that call me all the time, hey, I'm doing you know, an expo, can I borrow on a banner? Sure. If I'm not using it, someone on my team can use it. But if you, if you can borrow it from somebody, that's perfect. Get, get a good banner. Flowers, have you ever seen, you know, well, I'll, I'm, Alyssa Balzotti is amazing, isn't she? Did you notice she has flowers at every event, even on the stage? They're always intertwined in something. They're so beautiful. Flowers don't have to be expensive, though. If you want a little bit of flowers in your registration table, or you want to put them somewhere in your event, you can ask somebody on your team who has a garden to pick a couple of flowers and bring some vases from your kitchen, really. Or you can pay a little, you can, you know, price uh, compare and find someone who does great flowers. Um, your agenda and your printout. Agenda, you don't always have to have an agenda. Sometimes it's not good to tell people every detail of your event. Sometimes it, it, they're just watching that clock and they're watching what's next and they're, they're in control of it. And sometimes they relax a little bit more and learn a little bit more if they don't have that. But in, there are occasions where you need an agenda. What we did at our last event, which was a training event, we told everybody what was coming and, and we gave them, we divided it by when, it, when registration started, when the event started, when lunch was, when the breakout session started, and when we were planning on closing the event. That was it. So they were, they were like watching the clock, oh, they're, they're 45 minutes over. Or <laughs> they didn't know that if we were. <laughs> so we were kind of protecting ourselves with that. But that's something good you can choose to do, or if you're a planner, you want to put every detail of every minute on there, and then you want to be <coughs> on your event every minute telling, you know, this is what's next, whatever, then you can do that too. We still try to keep it on time as much as possible. Obviously, we still had to end it on time. Um, with the printouts, that can be expensive. Has anyone ever printed like more than 100 of a color <laughs> front and back? Okay, how much does that cost, do you think? $185 from there. It's not fun to do printouts that are in color. It's actually, you know, not cost effective at all. So make sure that when you're doing your budget for your event, if you have to have a printout or you think it's absolutely necessary, sometimes it's awesome to just make a link and say, hey, here's the Dropbox link, throw it up on the screen. You can go download this form, then everyone prints their own. One, one sheet, one colored sheet, everyone can do that, right? or you have to put it in your budget. Don't forget, there's these little extra costs that add up. And that reminds me, under venues, you really want to make sure, too, that you're looking for hidden costs. Um, we paid for a venue once, and we didn't realize that the tax that they put on there, plus another charge for employees, they added. It wasn't a part of the main talk. And that was a 20% gratuity thing. 20%? Whoa. When you're paying a lot of money, 20% is like, aye, that was an extra pinch. 
So just make sure that you're staying on top of those things. We paid someone to do our agenda last time, but you can make one on s'more, right? It's free, and you can make it, or have someone on your team who likes that, make it. Okay, what do I mean by find help? Because we've already talked about volunteers, right? I'm talking about for the planning of the event. If you find a teenager who's in school to do event planning, <laughs> not a teenager, but someone who's getting ready to go to college or is in college that likes this sort of thing, they're planning something like this, you know, pay them for a couple hours a week to help you manage this event or to help you maybe put together gift bags for volunteers or whatever it is. Because the more you can delegate to someone else or even just give up a little bit of uh, you know, your money or whatever towards uh, someone that can help you, um, you will have a lot less anxiety about your event, a lot less stress, and things will go more smoothly. Um, and be positive if something goes wrong. You're going to make mistakes. And again, I told you earlier, people do not always know that you made a mistake. So don't call yourself out on it like I do all the time. Just tell them how much you failed. Anyway, so really important, expressing gratitude. When you have people come and sit in front of you or in front of your per the, at the event that you created, say thank you. Let it be one of the first things out of your mouth. When they come in the room, say thank you. Thank you for coming. How, who drove the furthest? Who's, you know, who is that? And then give them a prize. Seriously. It's an honor to have someone come to something that you're doing. It's an honor. And especially if they are serving at that event. Especially. Take the time, take the extra time and say thank you and express gratitude. Okay, so, ah, please. Okay. <coughs> if you're a wellness advocate and you come to an event that's not your event, or if I'm putting on an event and I'm inviting all my team and other people's teams to come, right? Because it's Dr. Hill. And they're inviting, who are they inviting to come with them? Their friends who aren't even enrolled, right? So what might happen at the end of that event when someone closes it and tells people how to become a wellness advocate? If you don't tell other people who are coming, who are wellness advocates, to be responsible for their guests and bring the forms for them and bring all of those agreements and, and product order forms and what does a kit look like, are you going to provide it for 700 to 1,000 people? Are you doing that right now in your smaller classes? Because if you are, stop it. If you're inviting other people who are wellness advocates already to your classes, have them become there prepared if they're keeping it. Because you are enabling them if you're not. You're empowering them if you are. If you say, hey, make sure you bring everything you need for your guests because I don't have any. That's what I tell people now. I don't have anything for them. Make sure you bring something. I used to think that was such a huge risk because I was like, oh my goodness, we would lose that person if we don't, pay we don't have the thing. Well, now you can do it all online and on the app. That's awesome, right? We're going to use that app. One of the things we do at our events at our registration is ask people who invited them. <coughs> it's a culture thing, isn't it? It's my responsibility to make sure that if someone's trusting me to send their person in my event that's not yet enrolled, that they're going to go back to that person who sent them to that event, right? I want them to trust my future events. I want them to trust my people. And so we talk about this with our team. We talk about it with our volunteers. And at registration, it's so important. And if they don't know who it is, we say, could you call them or text them or look it up online? Sometimes we have to have them, um, you know, just find out who that person is. Because at the end of the class, when they're ready to enroll, and we don't know who that person is, and there's a special at the class, right? How are they going to get that special if they don't know who the person is? Or, or their, sorry, they don't know their, or their wellness advocate number. We need that number to put an enrollment in like that. And sometimes those events, especially if it's a Diamond Club event, right? They are expected to turn the form in. So that responsibility is on the person who invited them, and it's also on the people in the room who brought their guests, right, to take care of people. Not you, not the event planner. What is a chaser event? This would be an event that um, gives more education. This would be something like a follow-up event to what you just did that incorporates maybe more information about something that wasn't mentioned in the first event. So like another example again, Dr. Hill comes and he does a women's health <coughs> seminar, okay? And he tells everyone about hormones and women and all of that and everyone leaves really happy about Clary Sage and Clary Kong. And then what? <coughs> Wouldn't it be nice if you
you announced at your event that there's another opportunity to learn about the rest of the oils and introduction to essential oils class already set and ready, the date, the time, where to go, who to contact. Do that for them because then you have great momentum from your events because you will, you will capture them with whatever it is they came for and then you'll be able to educate them on the rest, which means they're going to use all the oils, not just the hormonal ones. <laughs> So this is really important. And I'll add to this that there's other events you can add on to that event that you're doing. And this is one of the most important things I've ever done. And it makes it hard <coughs> for a little extra work, but so worth it, and that is this. If you have an expert coming into town, call up your leaders, call a restaurant, make a reservation, and ask your expert to please have dinner with your leaders before or after the event, or breakfast the next day, whatever it is. Before Rob Young leaves town, he's having breakfast with my leaders, and I beg him, hey, before you book your flight, would you make sure you're there just a little bit earlier so that my leaders can meet you somewhere? Do you know what that has done to propel leaders on my team to actually be able to eat, or yeah, eat, or meet the expert that's coming into town? If you're ever putting on anything or if you have a special guest, Ask them if they wouldn't mind. Now, don't overwhelm them by inviting 100 people to that. Use it as an opportunity for your leaders who are working really hard, the ones that are in the trenches, the ones that really need that encouragement or you know, would be really blessed by meeting that person. Finally, I would just say, smile. Smile, take a deep breath. Focus on all the good things that are happening, even if something's gone wrong, you're the only one who knows about it. Pay attention to the people that are in front of you, not to whatever else is bothering you or going on, or maybe a leader is like not doing what you've told them to, or whatever. Forget about it. Just smile and enjoy, and you'll have the best event ever. Thank you.